Cheers. 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 I guess that's the official start then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to another lunch with Philip and Greg, and today's guest is Patrick Palmer, currently a full-time dad, but uh, occasional product manager for Adobe. Welcome, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Yes, indeed. Right now, full-time dad, I'm on paternity leave. Paternity leave? What the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know you need to explain it to some people, but fortunately inside Adobe, not so much. Um, it's actually a great thing. Uh, I'm enjoying it very much for all the five days I've had so far. <laughs> but I'll be gone until uh, March 2016, so it's quite and then, some time. And then jump straight back into NAB. Yes, that's the idea. A screaming start, won't it? <laughs> actually, I'm already scared. <laughs> so six months of paternity leave. Yeah. Right, right. And is that standard for Germany? Uh, actually, in Germany, you could take up to three years, believe it or not. Yes, I know, it's shocking. <laughs> that would be true for both my wife and I. Um, we're kind of splitting it, so the first six months we're both taking, and then my wife is going to do another six months. But Adobe has been very good to me in a sense that really no questions asked, even though obviously technically, legally, I could just say I'm gone. But uh, they've been very, very good to me in both prepping this, helping with the paperwork, and eventually just telling me, uh, please come back. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems to be, I, I think, the biggest fear when people do sabbaticals or are on paternity, right? Um, well, with me, as I'm indeed already scared of NAB, you don't have to ask that question, I guess. <laughs> I'm definitely coming back. <laughs> that will be very good. So it's going to be about six months then, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Great pretty much all of winter. We should have thought about that when planning this. <laughs> well, it's the onset of the cold season that needs to, it leads to paternity leave. Yes, yes, so you just came back from IBC. Yes, Probably this go around, you could tell me what's the news. <laughs> oh, there was nothing there. Um, yeah. HDR, yes. uh, bigger frame sizes, more frame rate. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty much the news. Um, and Apparently Adobe had some nice new releases oh, yes. in, those, in those areas too. <laughs> yeah. Actually, all right. and I think they all had to do with what you just mentioned. High yeah. frame rates, yeah. high dynamic range, wider color gamut you didn't mention. Oh, I didn't most mention most, that, most no. people put it into the HDR bucket, but I think that's kind of a mistake. It's really something else. But I think it's actually quite exciting to see that most of the things we've been talking about for the last couple of years yeah. are becoming much more real. Whenever people say there is nothing sensational to be seen at IBC or NAB, for me that's a good year because that means there's <laughs> the real stuff. Things come to life mm -hmm. and we're not talking about another hype or another maybe. It's, it's yeah. getting very real now. Yeah, having, having real releases, things that we can actually use now yeah. is so much better than that hype of yes. something. Oh, it's going to come, it's going to come. Or if it's lingering, right? Yeah. We've had that with 3D for the last couple of years, and yes. it seemed to be very exciting when it got started. And there's an interesting thing going on in parallel between 3D and what I read these days in the newspaper. Uh, and I'm not talking about, you know, the journals that we chaps read. I'm talking about the everybody's darling newspaper. <laughs> the newspaper for the ordinary people. <laughs> well, okay, Greg. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's what I meant. <laughs> um, you know, if you think about it, um, there's always the same question. Is there going to be any content? Yes. And with 3D, I think by now, sadly, the answer is, well, just a little bit, right? Just about enough to keep them, some theaters going with it, mm -hmm. to make sure that the investment in most of the equipment that we have by now wasn't in vain. But the truth is, it's not going to be something that's going to be in every home theater, no. and not every TV set is going to have it or even need it. A lot of people just decided that it's not for them. Mm. I don't think that's going to be the case with Ultra HD and all the various factors we just talked no. about, all, all the impact to it. And I, I actually think frame size isn't the biggest change there. Would no. you agree? No, I agree. Yeah. I mean, 3D, I was never super on board with 3D. I, mm. I just couldn't see how it would work in the home in practice. Yeah. Whereas it, it makes sense for a theater because, and it, and it almost, um, for a cinema, it, it means that, that it's an experience where you're getting a difference from what, what's at home. Yeah. So you go out, you're in a room, it doesn't matter that you're wearing glasses and whatever. But, but you really think it doesn't matter because, oh, well, I'm no. obviously very wearing glasses right now sure. and I'm not really bothered with it, but Unless most of my be. friends say that, you know, sitting through Avatar yes. was great except for the glasses did really hurt. <laughs> I, find, I find the glasses distracting. I, yeah. I'm aware of the frame of the glasses. Right. Yeah. But there's... The and there's 5% of people that get headaches and nausea. Yeah. yeah. The Chinese market is going to keep 3D alive. For sure. I, I hear from Deborah Kaufman all the time. That, oh, it's that incredible how many new releases are coming out of China yeah. that are done in 3D. And a lot of them are not converted, right? That's interesting too. We kind of skipped shooting 3D. If you look at the landscape yeah, right now, yeah. except for very, very few people in Hollywood 
no one's really shooting 3D. Most of it is converted, or indeed it's CG, where it's really easy and simple to set it up as 3D. 3, 3D in the home doesn't make sense because it's not the, that TV set in the corner is not the only thing you're focused on. And I'm also, I'm also not convinced that 4K in the home is going to be... It'll, it'll get there when, sim when people replace their TVs with a 4K TV because that's what's being offered yeah. and they don't really have a choice and it doesn't cost them any extra. They're not really going to notice the difference in most circumstances. It's High dynamic system. range. <laughs> oh yes. It's interesting that the label, if you think about 4K, obviously it means more resolution. But that's one of the many reasons why I like the term Ultra HD much yeah. better. Yeah. Because indeed it includes so much more than yeah. just going up in resolution, yeah. which honestly I'm not quite sure about the statement that it doesn't make any sense. For one thing, indeed, the screen sizes are getting larger. Now, I would have to have a serious conversation with my wife to get an 85 inch in place, well, and, and <laughs> because we would have to kind of, we would have to change all of our living room right. to make it work. We'd have to get a larger living room. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, we would need to get rid of a wall. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Set outside our front door and Maybe, put it. Put it yeah. yes. But then at that distance, you don't see the benefit of the ah, HD. Yes. But having that said, I, I think there still is a difference once you have all the other variants in place. If there is more dynamic range, yeah. if there is more, uh, if, if there is wider color gamut, if there is more frame rate, I think what you're going to see, and I've seen this in some really interesting experiments, even though you could still say it's not very noticeable in terms of pixel size. You can't un identify individual yeah. pixels on that screen. If everything goes up in parallel, there's still an additional sensation, even, even though you might say it's irrelevant to just have more resolution. I think if you isolate it, it probably is. Together with everything else, yes, yeah. there might be a very tangible difference. I, I can't see anyone not seeing the benefit of high dynamic range in a wider color gamut. I'd look, one of the things I went out of my way to see at IBC was the yeah. Dolby Vision. And uh -huh. even at their current level, I think what they're, they're targeting about 2,000 nits at yeah. the moment. It's like, whoa, that's almost too bright for me. Even the 600 nits reference display they've, that they've had for some years now, I thought was quite incredible at the 600 nits level. Right. Um, and I, I don't think we should get carried away with oh it's got to be 4,000 or 6,000 yeah. or eventually I think they're specking it up to 10,000 yeah. nits as the reference. Not sure if that really makes that much of a difference. On the other hand we'll get used to the 2,000 then we'll start appreciating the 4,000 I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but indeed it's so different from what we used to see mm. and I think it's actually important to embrace it for a very simple reason. If you look at the current production standard which is 100 nits, mm -hmm. well let's look at the average Sony, Samsung, LG, you name it consumer display that you can get at Best Buy or any department store really, if you measure them, quite nothing you buy this year will have less than 400 nits output. Yeah. So already those displays are actually far more capable than yeah. the standard that we're pr producing towards. And I think that's a problem. You actually will see this. They're trying to kind of get the input signal adapted to whatever they're actually producing in terms of actual dynamic range and light. And more, more often than not, it actually really looks horrible. <laughs> we need to have a newer standard in place to embrace what the display technology is already capable of. The best one I've seen from a consumer range, um, which ha has been measured by a friend of mine here in, in downtown Munich, had uh, well beyond a thousand nits a standard consumer display that doesn't claim to be high dynamic range. Okay. That you can buy today and it's less than two thousand dollars. And sharpness is the perception of sharpness has always been about contrast ra rather than Major actual fact. resolution. Yeah, yes. So and high dynamic range is again is immediately going to make people think, oh that's sharper simply because it has a higher dynamic range. <laughs> right, however you describe it. Yeah. I've, I've even heard that apply to 3D. Oh, it's sharper. Well, no, it's not. But <laughs> <laughs> what, what people mostly mean is there is, there is a visual sensation. Yeah. And the easiest way to describe it, if something's better, it must be sharper. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Which is why most of the TV sets, my wife is making fun of me all the time when we're on, on vacation. The first thing I do on every TV set is actually <laughs> tune it down, bring the sharpening down because it's so artificial yeah, and everything yeah, yeah, looks yeah. crap. Yeah. And then there's too much saturation, there's too much contrast. But I know why the manufacturers are doing it. We're not producing anything that makes those TVs look exciting according to what the technology is capable of. So yes, I, I truly believe HDR is actually not really a thing of the future in terms of what we can do today it's already here we just need to start embracing it in a way that you know really defines the standard which is why i think actually we need to reprioritize ultra hd factors um ultra hd one clearly has said that resolution is mostly what we're going after and then there is a lot of stuff optional like the white color gamut which 
you know, no display can produce just no, yet. No, no, right. right? That's it's, it's kind of a joke, actually. <laughs> Always amused when it's somebody says, "Oh yes, we can we display 16 million colors." It's like, on what size screen can you yeah. do that? Every pixel is different. You still only got like two million colors. <laughs> yeah, that's that's going to continue to be challenging with whatever technology. But that said. So maybe these brighter screens, one of the advantages of them is that for when people who are shopping and they go into a store and there's all those screens that are there in the shop, aren't they going to go, oh, that one is really sharp. I like that one. Or they'll see the, the contrast of the high dynamic range. Yes, yes. yes. I think there's still going to be a major difference between those screens that are already yelling at you right now, competing for attention yes. for that, oh, that's sharper. And we should stop making fun of that. <laughs> But it is kind of right. funny that, you know, when you don't have means to identify what's actually making the picture look good, yeah. Yeah. that people would call it sharper. I appreciate that, actually. Yeah. Uh, as long as, as you can still digest it and then kind of break it apart and see what actually made them think it's a better yeah. picture. Yeah. Mm. But right now, everything is screaming at you, and I don't like that very much. And I think mostly it's because we don't, ah, talking about content again, we don't have a lot of content that naturally shows the quality of those displays and those new technologies. I think that will change pretty radically the minute there is regular Ultra HD content with all those factors coming into play. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what needs to change to... Well, for one thing, we need to get decided what's high dynamic range. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. Because right now in the Ultra HD specs, it doesn't say it just yet, right? There's only talk about that becoming part of phase two. There is nothing on paper yet that says this is how we're going to do it exactly. So there are those competing approaches by Dolby, by Sony. Canon certainly has uh, something in the runnings. And that's not really all of it, right? Philips, I think, has also a system in place that, that could safely be called HDR. So let's see who, who is going to win that race. Uh, eventually, it might be competing systems that will all become part of what is specified. And so then it's a matter of which chipset is in there and we need to produce output accordingly. As it's all basically about metadata moving forward, that's not too scary. I would say this some 20 years ago, that would have been very scary because that would have meant even more deliverables. Right now, it's mostly about having the correct metadata in place. Shouldn't be too challenging. Metadata? Really? Is that important? Once again, <laughs> once again, I don't know. Metadata. Da-da. The da-da and metadata. <laughs> Well, uh, anyone who's it's watched a couple sexiest. of these lunches will know that I, I've never met a data I didn't like. <laughs> so, yes, keeps coming up. <laughs> it's not the sexiest topic, is it? No, not while recording, not while outputting. But honestly, if you think about it, let's, let's do a little game here. If you think about just, you know, some standard output, let's say you're producing a really nice piece of film. And according to current standards, OK, you've got your theatrical output of that. That already probably comes in a number of variations. For one thing, it's going to be different in Europe than it's going to be in the US. Uh, you might have different crop sizes, at least slight variations there. All right, so a number of outputs there. A little dreadful, if I'm honest, but that's the way it is. You have stereo output. You've got 5.1, 7.1, potentially 9.1 moving forward, talking about things that are different in Ultra HD, which is, again, why I like it much better than the term 4K. Mm -hmm. Well, 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 we'll have much more audio channels there, yeah. right? So maybe we'll have 22.1 or 22.2, I think. <laughs> or everything in between, because it's not necessarily fixed anymore moving forward, right? So interesting. If you were to do just those couple of theatrical outputs with those various audio options, hmm, that's a nice variation already. Let's add a 709 output to that with all the other variations on top of that. That's a nice stack. Let's add a Rec 2020 output for all of them. Let's also add, I'm not kidding, a 4x3 output to all of them yeah, for still, those who yes, need to see yeah. it in compatibility. Um, what else should we add? Let's add a 2398. Let's add a 24, a 30. Let's add a 48. Now specified, let's add the 60 and maybe the 72, the 96, the 120, all specified, right? <laughs> oh, nice stack. <laughs> if we're not going to do most of those things in metadata, it's going to be killer. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine at Sony has, has done a really, I shouldn't say nice chart, actually the most scary chart I've ever seen in terms of possible outputs from 120 frames per second, Rec 2020, high dynamic range. By the way, we didn't mention that yet again, piling up on the, on the stack. 
various aspect ratio sizes. Yes. After, uh, after taking all that into account, you had more than 500 outputs. Gosh. And that's before you Not even manageable. start getting yeah. into, into content right. ones. So another interesting thing I think moving forward is going to be the conversation around how to package it and how to potentially produce well, let's, let's be ridiculous. One package. <laughs> that's not going to happen. No, we'll we'll have happen. a couple more. And for yeah. streaming, you'll definitely need to, to get to the uh, renditions that you need for streaming purposes. So it's, it's never going to be one. But for all I care about, a master format that at least for the minute it leaves the post-production stage is the one thing that carries it all. That seems to be very much necessary if we indeed want to embrace all those additional requirements for Ultra HD. It's already ridiculous if you think about yeah, HD, yeah. SD, and theatrical release. It's already a wide range. Haven't even mentioned the difference of cuts between countries and between an airline version, a cinema version. Oh, yes. oh. Let's add subtitles to the mix. Yes. Let's add dub oh. versions to it. <laughs> it's an incredible amount of data to yeah. be managed. Yeah. So, yeah, metadata is going to be the future. I've been saying that for 10 years now. So the future must eventually get here. Yeah, you'll get it right <laughs> one day. One day you'll be right. Well, I think there is already a lot happening there, and it's quite interesting how many of the, um, well, it's not necessarily files, not plural, uh, how much of the data you capture on set, you yeah. just mentioned it, with audio and, and video file yeah. sync, that used to be very painful, it isn't anymore, yeah, right? Either things can be nicely automated or indeed there's additional metadata to help you yeah. do the job quicker, faster, or I think looking back at material that's already been recorded, in a more reliable way, in a sense that you'll be able to access it very quickly without having the expert who shot that day to actually make sense of the data yeah. that has been put in the can. Well, you can't say that anymore. We don't put things in the can anymore. Put things on the card? <laughs> uh, put things on, uh, yeah, on the card into ones and zeros. <laughs> Doesn't sound sexy, does it? <laughs> it makes me almost one, uh, pine for the days of PAL, CCAM, and NTSC, yeah. which that yeah. seems so complicated. Yes, it was complicated. 525 lines or versus 625 All lines made, and yes. uh, vertical, you know, various non-square pixel aspect ratios Can to I, deal with. Oh, that I was so complicated. A lot of the terminology is going to change. We've seen that with Photoshop, right? When Photoshop originally invented dodge and burn, it made perfectly Yes, perfect right, sense right. for its audience. People just knew what it is because because they all have been to a dark room at least once in their lifetime, and they just knew what physically dodging and burning is. Yeah. Light and dark, and from today's perspective, much more reasonable terms. Yeah. Yes, if if I try to explain to students most of the terminology that we're using in either stills or video, it doesn't matter really. Yes, yes. It's it's actually hard. To come to grips with it it really is even an edl an edit decision list what is that good for well student studios still require it as part of their deliverables yes, yes. So somebody still has to generate i actually it. think it's still a good thing to have it <laughs> some of those techniques are meaningful because they're kind of reducing a complexity to something that eventually you can understand and make productive that doesn't mean you shouldn't have all the extra data available like in a real project the edl is kind of a really dumb version of a project if you <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, look at it, how old it is. It's actually surprising that it's still in use. Yeah, well, studios... It's only, it's only because it's been a standard around for a long time and people don't really change, they don't move on. So, and so many companies have embraced it, right? The other thing is, you can take an EDL into almost any software today and yes. let's not kid ourselves, into almost everything that's hardware or used to be, right? It's so yeah. widespread. So there's still a reason for it. But yes, it needs some explaining <laughs> where it came from and why we're still using it. Yep. And how to fit 16 tracks of video into yes. an EDL. Oh, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're limited to eight characters. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's it's been broken up. <laughs> it's interesting that it's an industry that's so rapidly changing the technology, but at, at the very highest levels is, in, in fact, a very conservative industry and oh, changes yes. very, very slowly. I mean, look at the turnover from everything analog to mostly digital in the still photography world. And right. Let's not kid ourselves. That's not the most innovative industry that has ever been around, right? There are many conser conservative factors that have played a role when that industry made the move. But it took them a couple of years to eventually mostly switch to digital in the professional world and most certainly, I mean, look at the consumer world, right? It kind of happened overnight when people realized that they could shoot all day yeah. on a memory card and kind of delete the ones that they don't like mm -hmm. and shoot more than 36 when they're going to a wedding, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. which is 
a very nice thing if we're honest. And, and now we've got to the point where people are putting up signs at, at the, at least at the, res, the service part of their wedding saying, please don't everybody get up with your video cameras and, and take right. the service. Right. We've got it all covered. We'll give right. you copies. Yeah, because everyone can do it, but that doesn't mean every, everybody should really. It, it's yeah. kind of, I, I think we're seeing the maximum reach there right now. Everyone can cover, but not everybody has to. Yeah. <laughs> but the point I wanted to make is, it happened over a couple of years. I believe eventually when digital reached 50% market share, it only took two more years in still photography to reach 80%. Yeah. So very fast change. Think back, look back at what happened when the silicon imaging camera came about and how people looked at it and said, well, it's going to be another 20 years until we'll shoot with something like it. It was too strange, too odd, right. in many ways not capable to actually replace film at the time. but. Those who saw what it could do, and I mean, Slumdog Millionaire wasn't a mistake, let's, <laughs> let's face it, right? They immediately saw that there's potential there to shoot from angles that you could not possibly yeah. do with a film camera, and certainly not with something as big as a regular film camera yeah, back yeah. in the day, right? They, they've captured moments that were unthinkable before. And that changed the way cinematography works. So it did happen, but it took so much longer. A, that was already 10 years after that was pretty much digital only for stills. Yeah. B, most people said, no, 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 film's gonna be around for another 100 years. And and it, by, by the way, that might be true. <laughs> <laughs> film has a lot of advantages in that you can still hold it up to the light and oh, see yes. what it is compared with, with a digital camera. And it slows you down, which talking about those events you just mentioned, it slows you down in a way that sometimes can actually be nice. Mm -hmm. You're so much more focused and engaged and there is no room for making mistakes, so you better be well prepared. I'm actually a huge fan of shooting film on cameras. I just bought a, a, another um, Mamiya 67 <laughs> RZ, which is a lovely camera, but ooh, boy, it's not for snapshots. <laughs> Where do you, can you still get film for that? Oh, absolutely. Okay. You can buy it on Amazon. Uh, I've actually got a very nice little shop just around the corner. Oh. Uh, who's got really fresh rolls of film by, by really fresh. I mean, they're, they're not over their expiration date by fi some five years already. <laughs> okay. Well, Kodak and I'm not sure about Fuji, but Kodak is still definitely making new rolls. So, oh, yes, okay. you can get them. They're not even overly expensive. Mm. And I think it's a side benefit, by the way, from the contract that Kodak has now uh, with, the, right. with yeah. the Hollywood industry. It's just you need a certain amount of throughput to being able to even continue to manufacture film. And I think that's exactly the amount that Hollywood has ordered, not knowing whether they need that volume. But it, it honestly doesn't matter really for those who want to shoot film. Yes, it's getting a bit more expensive. I'm a little worried about the quality, if I'm honest, because if you don't have labs that produce output every day, three shifts. Yeah, the skills level is gonna go down. It's not so much the skills level. that that probably will happen over time too, even though I'm, I'm honestly sure there will be enough people who just appreciate the process mm -hmm. and the quality. There is quality with film. Let's, let's not make any mistake about what digital is. Digital is convenient. It doesn't mean that quality is always yeah. better. Quality can be fantastic. It depends on what you're shooting, right? But I've seen still amazing things shot on film. There's a reason why the current Star Wars is shot on film. They know why they're doing it. It's not just nostalgia. Yeah. But Having that said, uh, I'm, I'm more worried about really the process itself, the lab, the humidity, the temperature, uh, the chemistry itself. If that is not constantly running, you'll have more variation in the process, oh, yeah, yeah. right? Ah, so, because it's a chemical process, yes. and so it needs to be... And it's a very fragile chemical process. It's a little ironic that, that the current Star Wars is being shot on film, though, because <laughs> didn't, weren't they, in the, the second trilogy, weren't they uh, pioneers of using mm. digital acquisition in that? Absolutely. It was the, the first Sony... Um, F900? Um, I think they even started with a 700, or was it the 900, indeed? I think you're right, it was the 900. Deep in my memory. Early, early <laughs> stages. Yeah. They should go back to stop motion models too. Yes. And that's not the reason why I think the look of it wasn't what the fans expected. Yeah. Honestly, just, you know, those drones, armies, more isn't always better. I think that's, that's just, that's the way I look at it. I actually quite like what I've seen from, from the, what they released so far. Yes, probably because I'm 40 plus. So yes, there is a little bit of, you know, there is nostalgia there, but that's not all there is. It, it just seems to be more, I don't know. It is something that you think you could be part of. 
its scenes, its sets, it's also because those characters have been around for so long. Yeah, right. It's it's become very real to us, I think. If you look at an army of a thousand drone operated thingies, yeah. plasticky, whatever it is, <laughs> it's not very tangible. I think that's that's probably more than the look of it, the issue with it. It's it's astonishing though that they got away with shooting that at the time yeah. at H D. Yeah. If you think about the controversies we're still having today, whether 2K or 2.5K is good enough. That's the other part of the 4K conversation, right? Look at theatrical releases today. Yeah, that mostly huge part of it is shot HD, and even the high-end ones are done in 2K. And then, of course, there is everything that's shot on the red, where people obviously go for 4, 5, and 6K. Question goes to you guys, from the people you talk to. You, do you think most people realize the difference when they go to see a movie? Is that the, the differentiating item? I, I don't think people do. I, I really think people go to, go to the cinema to get caught up in a story. I think so too. And they don't care. And, and I, you know, that's to me a very important point, is that we talk a lot about the technology. Mm. We, we're involved with it. We love the technology, you know, kind of. We're geeks. We are. <laughs> and we, we need to, to keep in mind that, that most people most people's televisions are badly adjusted. The fact you have to go and adjust them when you go on vacation. Even most theaters are badly adjusted, let's face it. Yeah, and most people don't care about that. They right. go to be involved yeah. in a story, and as long as the quality is good enough for them to get involved in the story, surely yeah. that's, that's what we're really about. And sometimes focusing too much on the technology gets, away, gets us away from that story. Yeah. Mm. How did you get started? Whew. In this industry or yeah. otherwise? <laughs> well, I mean, did you start in this industry or did you go somewhere else first? Oh, my life is all about serendipity and embracing it. Ah, interesting. <laughs> no, didn't start in the film and video business at all. Um, believe it or not, I actually studied uh, German literature and language and international history. Hmm? That's odd. Okay. <laughs> but it was very interesting, taught me a lot. And I would do it again without ever thinking about it. I met so many interesting people and I honestly think, I mean, look who's here. We're not from the same country. <laughs> we have very different traditions, very different cultural background. I really learned to embrace traditions and, and indeed cultural diversity um, via both studying my own language, which helps to understand who you are, I guess. And international history wasn't a bad thing either, but. Um, I found it to be ridiculously helpful in all my conversations with people from all around the globe to, well, know a bit more about my own culture, but also to have started learning about the huge diversity there is all around us. It's, so, it's interesting coming into Europe because, you know, Australia's culture is very young, America's culture is relatively young, and Europe's culture is very old by comparison. It's rich and thick, and for the better part, we don't know much about it. <laughs> we just enjoy living in nice buildings from, I don't know, 1596, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, which pretty much predates any of the buildings you could live in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or would want to. Right, or, or would want to. I, I was going to add, yeah, I'm not sure if I would want to live in a building that old. <laughs> but yeah, so that's how, how I got started, not being in the industry, if you will. I, I did a number of things on the side, kind of, um, if you will, to make my living. And there is the connection. So I started working as a professional photographer um, in the early 90s by accident, really. I always loved photography. Uh, started doing that in school. Fortunately, we've had a lab and it was really equipped with everything you could think of. Everything was old and needed to be repaired all the time, which was good. <laughs> Learned a ton about the, the, the process and talking about the, the, the chemical process as well. Uh, I noticed how fragile it is, and even just by the humidity going up and down, it was incredible to see that. Um, and slightest leak of light, and oh, somebody opened the door at the wrong time. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's how I learned that not everything is about exposure. <laughs> which is why I got away shooting cheap cameras at the time, um, before I eventually bought a Nikon F4, which was the pride of the day, uh -huh. only to realize that shortly thereafter, Nikon announced the F5. <laughs> Which, and then the yeah. F6 and then the F69 and 50 and 78. And <laughs> with film, honestly, yes, there was a matter of convenience with some of it, especially if you had to shoot fast. Yeah. But right now I'm shooting, when I'm shooting film, I'm mostly shooting a Nikon uh, FM. Mm -hmm. 
that's got pretty much nothing but a meter. <laughs> it does yeah. matter. You, you needed a lot more skill. I and mean, I think one of the right. things that has changed, I think, in, in the technology or yeah. the industry is that you, you know, you had an immense learning curve oh, yes. to get a good result with film before you could even really get a good result. Yes. Whereas now the automatics are there enough that most people can get a good enough result for their satisfaction. Not necessarily to satisfy the Gary Adcocks of our world, but, yes. you know, but to satisfy most people. A disadvantage if you're talking about working with light in particular in your scene, color and light yeah. are probably less controlled because the picture itself will look somewhat all right. There is another advantage of it though. I really love the fact that you can actually focus on framing a lot more. Yes. You can focus on everything that's happening in front of the camera, yeah. talking about not being so geeky and nerdy. Yeah. I've seen amazing things from film school students and they knew very little about the process that eventually brought all the technology to life as we know it today. Mm -hmm. And probably for them, it, it isn't that important. They all do different things. They will make other mistakes. Probably they'll eventually look at some of the early masterpieces in working with light in black and white yeah. film. I have no doubt that they'll eventually grab what's really at the heart of it and, and make it productive within that environment. But I'm, I'm not whining about film going away. I'm just saying yeah. for slowing well, you I'm, down to learn something yeah. about the right. process, it, right. it can be quite I'm nice. I'm really thankful that I started in film and did my time in the dark room and, you know, yeah. with black and white printing and then a, a later iteration with Cibachrome and doing all that. And It's certainly a different attitude from just, you know, oh, shoot, 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 because... Something's going to be good in there. Oh, yeah. be good, yeah. But as you ask, I'll give you the quick tour of the rest of it. So <laughs> yeah. then I switched to become uh, a design professional. I don't quite know why, but... Um, you wanted to play with computers? No, no, actually, um, <laughs> one of the journals I worked for at the time had a huge issue when they switched to PageMaker at the time. Uh -huh. um, that was before InDesign, and they just didn't have enough people who had the skills to operate it, and I was kind of nerdy enough to say, okay, at least, you know, the part where, where I'll see my own pictures appear, let me do the Photoshop work, yes. <laughs> and. I'll also bring it in and make sure you're not cropping it the way I don't want to and all that kind of, <laughs> you know, stuff <laughs> you could do to a picture. Um, I quite li like working at PageMaker. It was simple, it was efficient. Yes. Actually, with the computers at the time, it was even fast. It was astonishing what yeah. Adobe made of it mm -hmm. when they acquired, even before at Elgis, it was actually a really good program. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised that they weren't using Quark at the time because that seemed to be taking over the market. Yeah. But I think the PageMaker was kind of the. I mean, we we had PageMaker because yeah. it was because Quark was ridiculously expensive. Mm. So PageMaker was kind of the, Could be the, reason. the 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 lower, slightly lower featured, but much more affordable. Yeah. But oh yeah, once you knew how that thing worked, it, it you could just it sang. It was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful, which is why I'm so happy eventually they'll be replaced with InDesign and made everything yes. better. And the yeah, things yeah. that were impossible in PageMaker, like getting a real time full resolution preview of your imagery, that's something that always bothered me. So you had your image, but you couldn't tell whether or not it would actually print all right. right. All those things in the it's 90s. Like early NLEs. You, oh, yes. yes. You could, oh, you know, God. the image quality was so poor that, you know, the, you get shots out of focus because you couldn't tell it was in focus. Or <laughs> yeah, lip sync was off. Interesting that there is a lot in parallel in the NLE world, even in the same time frame, if yeah. you will. Mm. The, the 90s were quite interesting. Mm. So many things became possible, but either they took a shocking amount of time <laughs> or they didn't give you the quality that was necessary to control what you were doing properly. It's, it's I do remember impressive what we can do today compared mm. to those standards. I do remember waiting for 20 minutes for some filters to apply in Photoshop. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is a print resolution and I'm just gonna go away and have lunch and come back. <laughs> so did that photography design uh, actually was one of the first beta testers of InDesign in Germany. You can kind of see that me being at Adobe today it's probably for a reason. It was a long journey towards that. <laughs> so, um, for all the Adobe products I've used along the way, I should probably end up in Adobe. <laughs> so I think that was in, oh, oh my. If memory serves me well, that must have been 98. Shortly thereafter, a good friend of mine from school called me and said, I think I've got something. And that little something was the original frame cycle product which, uh, well, within a year's time became the de facto standard in digital playback for the visual effects industry and in general for the post-production industry. That was quite an interesting start to build a company because it wasn't, you know, there was no business plan and talks with the bank. Yeah, yeah. There was just basically an accident my friend Lynn Kaiser made over the weekend. 
and he's actually quite all right with that description. That accident was that he had a real desire to do something that would just eliminate QuickTime from his 3D rendering process. <laughs> he just didn't want to wait for the QuickTime, only to notice that frame 3245 had a problem, only to do it all over yeah, again. Yeah, right. yeah. So he wanted just to look at the frames in real time if possible, which is why he invented FrameCycle and then put it out there on the web. Um, with a download link, a short description, it was free of charge at the time. He really didn't think there is you know, more than three people in the world who'd be interested. Said, yeah. There was no research done, is what I'm saying. Yeah. He just put it out there and I think within a week or so he got a call from uh, his uh, ISP, his uh, uh, internet provider, saying, you really need to put that framecycle.exe down yeah. because our servers can't take the load anymore. <laughs> so it became a huge hit. In a, and that was in, in uh, 2000, right? So today I don't think an ISP would ever be bothered to call you, but band bandwidth at the time still was a problem. Precious, yes. yep, yes, <laughs> it was precious indeed. You just upload it to Dropbox and yeah. it wouldn't matter. <laughs> or Amazon. <laughs> so then he got a couple of calls from uh, Disney, Warner Brothers, Digital Domain at the time. All three became uh, a huge factor in beta testing the program. That's pretty much when I started working with Lynn on the plan for what eventually would become the company that some 10 years later was sold to Adobe. So Iridas was founded basically based on an accident that Lynn made, or let's call it just a happy coding weekend. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of businesses have been built on happy coding weekends. You would be surprised how many businesses I could tell you have started like that, even though now they pretend there's been a pl business plan oh, and, and yeah, yeah. Oh, it was all expensive. <laughs> we always make up the history afterwards. I actually think it's kind of nice to know that uh, it happened without a plan. It just happened because there was a good idea. And, right. and a lot of companies that don't succeed, yeah. but bring something very interesting to the market, are built like that. Yeah. Right? A lot of products that we happily use today by big brands, yeah. not everything is inv invented by big brands, which yeah. is also yeah. why I have both hearts still working here. I have all the passion for what I've had for those 10 years at Aerodas for, you know, having a small company with only up to 15 people, yeah. trying to produce innovation day after day after day. On the other hand, making it work for everybody, which is certainly Adobe's strength. Yeah. <laughs> Embracing that, taking the best, taking the guts out of it if need be, not just taking the product. Frame Cycle as a product today is pretty much superfluous, right? Yeah. There have been successful products, there have been products that were more specialized in certain niche areas, but there's been really quite nothing uh, as we moved on to do color yeah, only two years later, a, right? It's a big jump between FrameCycler and, and, and Speaker. Oh, absolutely, right? And Speaker was so, you know, such a specialty product for such a limited audience and still would be today if we'd be still uh, a company on our own. Uh, there are other examples like that, even though most companies stopped producing standalone color correction products. If you look at the market today, it's, it's, a, it's a very narrow market. Mm -hmm still niche in a way, mm -hmm. um, narrow in a sense that it's no longer 12 manufacturers trying to compete over that particular product. So that's interesting too. It, it's, some people would call it consolidation, mm -hmm. uh, but you could also say that there is no longer really that massive need for something that is that heavily specialized. The way we're doing it now, yeah. if you look at the integration into Premiere Pro, I'm actually rather proud of something that makes what I've done for the 10 years before ridiculous and make, makes yeah, it superfluous, say, right? Yes, it doesn't almost, it, I, was, I was going to ask, you know, the integration or what Adobe have done with the technology yeah. is almost like gutted speed grade and put it in, Transplant. the, transplanted the best of it into, into Premiere. It's definitely transplanted, even though our engineers would actually say, no, not really. <laughs> as we kind of avoided every mistake we ever made with speed grade. <laughs> At least I hope so. <laughs> That's, there's been a lot of mistakes based on, you know, 2003's technology, if you like. Right, yeah. A lot of things just weren't doable on GPU at the time. Yeah. So we had to be creative in, in either not implementing everything we ever wanted. Um, secondary blur, for example, would be a really good example that was never really good in speed grade. Uh, or blur in general because it was so limited on, on back in the days uh, GPUs, right? It just couldn't do that much. It's incredible to see what you can do even on entry-level GPUs on a MacBook today. It's, a, it's interesting how the technology drives the creativity which drives the technology which drives the creativity. I saw, saw this with the development of After Effects. Then yes. the, the first users of After Effects sort of said, well this is great, could we do this with it? And then that 
pushes it in another yeah. direction and then it feeds back and the product gets stronger and, and stronger. The team is actually a great example of not knowing what the technology is going to be used for eventually. Right. Uh, that team is probably the most humble I've worked with so far and it's for a reason because they've got such a diverse audience. For one thing, it's not one thing you do with After Effects, right? It's so many things, even if you're just specializing in motion graphics, which really is at the heart of it. If you just skip whatever you could do in compositing, there's a staggering amount of things people do day, on a daily basis, and mostly with tools in combination that we can't predict really. So yeah. that's also why you don't have more one-click modules that would magically do everything for you. The creativity in the product, it can be scary if you get started, let's yeah. be honest about it. After Effects can be very scary because there's a gazillion things. Yes, it's yes, a, a as, as most people describe it, a 747 cockpit <laughs> in front of you. Right. Okay, nuke, uh, launch control, which one is it? <laughs> I, I remember it clearly. Um, a client came in wanting to do a music video, and this is in the very early days of After Effects, mm -hmm. and they were much more used to the conventional switcher where each button was a dedicated effect, and they said, right. well, show me what you can do. It's like, right, and you've only got a week to do this. We need these six or seven months before I could show you what right. every filter could, could do in my limited range of filters of After Effects of 1998. Right. And so how could you possibly do that? It's like, what do you want to do and yeah. I can create it in After Effects or in whatever tool I'm going to use. And it's such a different mindset and it's a different way. It even stimulates the brain. I'm actually seriously, I'm not joking, seriously convinced after hearing from, uh, I probably can't mention the name right now, but hopefully that study will come out. So let, let me just allude yeah. to something that you might see in the news <laughs> in the future. You um, heard it here first. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Something that, that I find to be super interesting, uh, you've probably heard about uh, those tests that have been done on Alzheimer's patients yes. when they play the piano or any musical instrument, but the piano seems to be most stimulating. Uh, your neural connections are actually being re-established to a certain degree. Even new ones are being built, which for adults. So that's why we didn't have anything to eat yet. <laughs> She just completely forgot about it. I isn't it funny? We're talking about Alzheimer's and how to prevent <laughs> it from happening. What a perfect synchronicity. <laughs> oh my God, life's so good sometimes. Well, that's okay. We can probably almost finish the interview before we even eat. Yes, that might be true. <laughs> so you won't look at full plates because we're talking too much to even have it. Well, we haven't even started talking about food and that's a common interest yet too. <laughs> And my favorite questions for the end are still not come up, and they're gonna, I'm sure they're going to... Oh, I, I have a question for a speed grade guy. So Hold that thought things? until we're done with that Alzheimer's yes, thing, yes, because yes, it yes, is yes. it is really very interesting. So you've heard that about piano players and general musical instruments, that it can actually help at least keep your brain functioning or even reestablish some of those neural connections uh, that have been damaged. Fascinating, really. By the way, the piano does so much more for you than, let's say, playing the flute. So what, and I, I think it's, it's big, well... You've got 10 fingers and there's a lot of coordination, so mm -hmm. it's probably very stimulating. So here's the thing, um, that science, a scientist I won't name because I'm not quite sure if it will be yeah, published. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so for right now, let's just say it's interesting hearsay. He said that he doesn't know of a single motion graphics artist who's got trouble with Alzheimer's. Yeah. Now I might say, well, that's because most of them are not really 80 yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Sure, sure. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going However, quickly through the, yes. The However, so he, he's conducting a study as to how working a product like After Effects ah. stimulates the brain. And it turns out the, the preliminary answer is yes, it does. So being able to manipulate those complex tasks and being able to drive that 747, it actually keeps you very much alive, I guess. Interesting. <laughs> A lot of people use After Effects for color correction. Yeah. I don't understand why, but I guess it's because it's, it's what they know, it's the tools they know. I th no, I think it's, it's for a different reason. Um, there is a plethora of effects that you can buy from, you know, me, my brother, and then some other people. <laughs> Just a lot of people produce really capable little tools that work perfectly within the After Effects plugin. So it makes it easier than going into a full-blown color correction? It, it doesn't necessarily make it easier, but there are some specialized things that you wouldn't find in a full-blown color correction system. Um, and there are some interesting examples here. So it's just 
A, it's the amount of tools you can get. B, how cheap it is. Mm -hmm. C, that in, indeed it uses the same paradigms as most things in After Effects if those plugins are done well. And I think that's the reason why a lot of people do it. Plus, there is something else. So if you know your way around After Effects, it's actually very easy to do this for a lot of shots. And that didn't used to be so easy on most, if not all, color correction systems if you're coming from a compositing background. Right. But they don't use it for just doing color. I think that's, that's the hidden secret there. They're using it for, for mostly fixing a problem with the shot. If you think of something like, you know, it's, it's become so standard now to stabilize your shot. And arguably, every system, every NLE now has something to do it. Most of them do it quite good, actually. But with little control, rightfully so. In the NLE, you wouldn't want, that's the thing. Oh my God, 100 knobs just for st stabilization? Please, please don't, right? In After Effects, if there is a tricky one where you need more control, and I'm talking control beyond cropping and resizing and, you know, stable, medium, not so much, those, those simple things you can mit manipulate even without knowing much about the technology. In After Effects itself, you can even control which points are selected for doing the stabilization. You can kind of set the focal plane to work with the stabilization algorithm. You can do anything you would do in After Effects to do that kind of two and a half D analysis to understand the shot and make intelligent decisions. And the same thing is true for color. Those color tools that are available for After Effects, again, sometimes might do odd things where you think, boy, why would I really want to have a split color correction for the lower third of the spectrum and in HLS? Doesn't appear in any of the color correction applications. Mm -hmm. It is available as a plugin. Turns out that in restoration, this is a very helpful thing. Ah. Right? Because you have actually a fade that affects very particular areas mm -hmm. in, in the lower third of the range. And you could do this with a regular color corrector in curves. If only you, you'd know how to do it. <laughs> and if it's precise enough, right? In After Effects, you all of a sudden have kind of a thousand controls just for that particular thingy. So you measure it once you set it up and then you kind of measure the input, use your defined controlled output, see what's the difference. And then you have kind of three knobs that you can even build in that little plugin that will help you to just basically offset whatever is the aging of that film. And that's the reason why it still exists and why it's, why it's so popular. You, you'd think it's a niche, and I thought when I came on board with Adobe, when they said, first thing you got to do is talk to the After Effects people. And I kind of, why? <laughs> I want to talk to the editing people because I always wanted better color controls in, edit, in editorial. And they said, no, no, believe me, there's a reason why I need to talk to After Effects. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, some, sometimes it's unexpected. Yeah. And most people seem to want, with, with color correction, most people want to seem to use it at a fairly simple level. There are those who, oh, yes. like with After Effects, who will use it at an incredibly powerful level. You know, your, your um, Angie Taylors and oh, yeah. um, Chris and Trish, Chris and Trish Meyer. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, you know, they, they are incredibly capable with that app. And there, there are a lot of people who use After Effects, at a, like assistant editors who use After Effects at a fairly superficial level. And that's what makes so much sense about bringing the, th the After Effects tools that they want to use and the yeah. speed grade tools that they want to use into the primary app. And I think that's been a really good direction for... Yes. That also was the primary motivation to have the Lumetri panel in After Effects. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not so much because we think a lot of people will use it in After Effects itself, even though one group you just mentioned yeah. probably will, yeah. also because they're probably also using Premiere and then it's the same set of tools, so yeah. it just greatly simplifies getting started, which yeah. I think in color grading in general has been the biggest problem ever since. I opened Apple Color, it's like, yeah, okay, bye. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I've heard those same comments about speed grade, even though I think it was a little easier to get, but it's still, it, essentially, at the heart of it, there's something very interesting about what's happening right now. All of the color correction applications that came about in the last 10 years, all of them, no exception, have worked based on the model that has been established in the early 80s by Da Vinci, the original one. Yeah, yeah. Um, alongside the triple eight, there was that notion that you have your three tracker balls and then eventually the fourth one to control some of the geometry and some other night things too. If you look at the control surfaces, they haven't changed much since the 80s, right? Yes, they're a little fancier. They have backlit LEDs and they're pretty, they have some more knobs, but 
at the heart of it, every color is, I mean, what's the thing that's worn out first? Well, it's the rubber on, <laughs> on, on the wheels. Yeah. Why? Because that's what you do 90% of yeah. the time. That's what's giving you most of the power in a tactile interface. But it's been limiting what we've been doing in software for many years. Yeah. Speakrate not being any exception there. We've modeled everything around the color wheels, right? We've called it a 12-way. And it was an interesting model to have low, mid-high differentiation for color wheels. But A, very overwhelming for someone who's getting started. B, if you're not operating it with a control surface, yeah, yes. I think we've done some nice things like dampening the mouse action and if you move far to the left, you can't ever exceed the screen like you do with the mouse pointer. So we've done some nice things to kind of make it work, mm -hmm. but the paradigm hasn't shifted. It was just trying to make it nice in software based on the model that essentially is designed for something that you would touch, but you can't, right? And we do know that ever since it became available, to more people. I mean, color correction has been a thing for a couple of hundred folks up yeah, until yeah, recently. Yeah, Let's yeah, not forget yeah, about yeah. that, right? Because the systems were so ridiculously expensive yeah. and rightfully so because <laughs> the way they've been built, it was expensive to make them. So with software, that's changed. But again, I, I don't think the mental model has changed much. And, and food is a hobby of yours or just an interest or just, <sighs> it's a hobby of Greg's and an interest of mine? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. That's one of the many reasons why I love traveling. Yeah. Ah. I'm just starting to get into that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, bottom line for, for the color tools. Right now we're trying to shift the paradigm. There is a new one coming, I think. We're not quite there yet, but we're well on our way to see another tactile interface. Touch and multi-touch is so underused in our industry. It's, it's actually, it's unbelievable how many things I've seen in other industries. Like if you look at CAD, boggles the mind what you can do on an iPad with, with some of those apps that right. allow you to do yeah. things that actually you couldn't do at the same speed and at the same precision with mouse and tablet. Yeah. And, and that there haven't been control surfaces the traditional style yeah. like we've had in color grading. So I think those will exist for a long time for those who are doing it 24-7. Yeah. But for everybody else, we're using that imitation in software of a control surface where it does not make any sense anymore. So I personally would like to see color wheels go away for the better part because there is nothing in, in a touch-friendly environment where you can do nearly the same. There have been so many apps by now. I'm sure you've seen many of them too. Yeah. For me, they're all feigning because I need to look at what I'm touching to be able to, to use the control and that makes it completely ridiculous, yeah. right? So it needs to be something where I can focus on the picture and then do something with my hands and not be limited to mouse or a pen and not be limited to be on one particular control. And I think that's kind of the next step where we need to go to. We need to make it superfluous for most people to have a control surface. They've got, they've got some very capable input devices and we're not really taking advantage of that. I, I suspect there are some very clever minds at Adobe that are, that are dealing with these issues now and we're seeing the start of... of You've already issues. seen that in the editing part. We've done that now yeah. successfully yeah. On, on some of the that's editing exactly controls. What was leading to. <laughs> and you know what? I love it. I didn't think much of it when we got started with this project because the entire product still has so many things you wouldn't just use with touch. Yeah. But the thing is, you already mentioned there are different audiences for the application, actually for everything there is right now. So, and even within specific tiers, you don't always do the same thing. Mm. And for doing a rough cut, I actually love sitting on the couch. Environment does matter, don't you think? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. right? for, for some things, it actually is kind of nice to relax and not be in front of a computer and, and just really focus on the picture you've got. Mm -hmm. See, hopefully, not much more but the picture and be someplace else, be, inspi be inspired by something else. We're sitting here in a beer garden and not in a dreadful office and I'm, I'm actually thankful for that. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing is true for all the work we do, right? So I think it will just open up additional oh, yeah. opportunities. Yeah. Environment, environment really matters for creativity. Mm. I've got one more question sort of related to the color correction tools in the NLE. So traditionally, when we're talking about color correction, we're really talking about a finishing job. So we've reached picture lock, whatever that means these days. <laughs> then it goes to... to oh, the, um, the we all laugh when we say picture lock, but... <laughs> ah, we could have a 30-minute laugh job on picture lock now. <laughs> okay, picture lock. Yeah, that's why we made a change list tool for Premiere, Greg. <laughs> goes to color correction so that then the 
the specific look that the colorist wants can be applied to it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the opportunity that comes with color correction in an NLE means I'm not saying finishing as you go necessarily, but at least you can, you can do something so that when it comes time to do uh, a preview screening or um, showing a, a director or whoever else what's happening, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily looking at raw Mm. Um, color corrected footage. Absolutely. So I think that's that's kind of a that's a, a real workflow change because you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, the director's coming in quick. Let's throw this out to Da Vinci and um, right. and try to to make it look um, more like what it's going to look like at the end. But don't spend too much time on it because we're not a picture lock yet. So. And that's a problem because you then being asked to use a system that is designed to spend a lot of time on yeah. everything. Right. To not spend much time on the picture. That that is a contradiction that I find hard to accept. Also, mm. you're using a talent that's typically well-trained mm -hmm. and specialized, which for this job seems a little bit, you know, over the top, if I'm yeah. honest. Uh, plus, we all know one thing for sure, budgets are going to be tighter tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's yeah. not going to change, so we need to be smart about which tools to use for what purpose and, and how to present the material that we're using in a way that, while not finished, it looks good enough yeah. to, to not present a stumbling well, it's another, issue. It's right? another change. Yeah. You know, not only are the budgets getting constrained, but the editor, editor and its editorial team are expected to produce something that looks like That's it's good. the finished product, that has at least good, good quality temporary effects on it, that yeah. has got good quality audio, and Agreed. has temporary audio effects on it. And audio is a good point. And so these are. This is the part of the whole pressure of everything that's pushing down into the editorial phase. Right. You know, unfortunately, we'll see. Somebody will do, say, oh, we've got 8K cameras, so we're going to do two, two cameras, 8K on the scene, we're going to do one take, a good take, and everything else will be decided in, in editorial. And, you know, heaven right. forbid wow. we have light field cameras as well. And so we're not even going to choose the focus in all of it. Productions will do it because it's so quick to produce, mm. and yet it's going to push editorial, and it's going to tend, all the work that should have been done on production is now going to be pushed into, into right. post. But Damn. back to your question, I think, there's something interesting about having more capable color correction and color grading tools in an NLE. There's a danger. You start playing with it for no reason. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe in that argument because every NLE today is very dangerous for everybody. Yeah. Right? You can do so many things that are not catering to the story, that are not necessary mm -hmm. for the part of the process you're working on at the moment. So that's a skill that people just bring to the job. Yeah. And that's actually all there is. So saying that you shouldn't have a certain tool as part of a certain process because it could be dangerous over time, not a huge belief in that argument. If it's meaningful to some of the things you do, let's have it. And then I think we'll start talking about the paradigm shift. I wouldn't call it a sea change because for a lot of people it already happened, but I think we'll have a much clearer and better understanding of there being a difference between what is a look for your production what is color correction, and then eventually what is fine-tuned grading for all of it, yeah. right? Right now, it, it all seems to be one thing for most people. Mm. It's very intransparent indeed, because going out of the NLE, coming back, there is a lot of things that need to happen on the technical side, which is in the way. It's intransparent in, in, in many ways, really, to most people who actually need to understand it so they can budget it properly. If you decide that look design is an integral part of your production, make it so. Yeah. Spend less money on the color correction, make it very simple, Let's let that be done up front by an assistant, yeah. fine tune it at the very end when you're talking about finishing. There's time to get everything right. Yeah. To work with the correct look while you're editing, yeah. you just mentioned audio. It's the same thing to me. If there's crap audio, you, yeah. your edit will be different. Yeah. Right. You're not getting the same pacing. You're not getting the same dynamics. All those things should be good enough to make the story work, and then eventually you'll do the polishing. When, yeah, and that's. Right. I think we're blurring this line between, Absolutely. As, you know, offline and online. It wasn't wasn't really about technology. It was really about a mindset. In offline, you're focused only on the story. Right. The audio can be up and down, and and I guess directors and yes. and producers were smart enough in the day to know that yes, this is temporary. You know, yeah. this is going to change because we've seen it in the past. Well. It was never pushed. convenient though, no one yeah. liked it. Nobody we liked just it. worked with it because there was no other way. Yeah, now we're getting that push back into editorial and that's all work time that can't be spent on story. 
And so I, th I think we're, this, this is a really two-edged sword, is that you know, offline is really about storytelling, not about finishing, whereas online is you know, a finishing pass. I, <laughs> I, I was tasked to write a story about a long time ago about how you know, this is the year of finishing you know, uncompressed on the desktop so we can finish on the desktop. And I thought that's pretty straightforward until I got on the Avid list. Mm. And that's, they very quickly um, enlightened me that, no, it's not really about the technology, it's really about this change of focus. And, and even for a single, as a single editor, I've never worked on an editorial team. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, when I'm putting something together, I focus on just getting a flow of the story and, and the, my sound bites and everything to work into a smooth story. Right. Then I might go back and find B-roll that makes it make sense. And then, then I'll do a pass where I focus on just getting the titles in and focus on a pass where I just get the levels right and the music right. And, you know, each time I change mind. So I, I sort of, I sort of, multi, I came up with the idea of a multi-line edit, mm -hmm. not just offline, online, but offline, online, partial online, you know, audio online, video online, um, title online, and each, each pass got its own focus wow. because you can't focus on all of those things at once. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of unfair to editorial, I think, to try and make an editor focus on colour grade, audio, and yeah, you know, finally if you've got assistance to look after all that for you, yeah. it's still got to come out of one mind ultimately. Yes. Totally agree with you. Blurring the lines is, is probably an understatement. I think it eventually, it is one now technically, or at least it's possible. Mm. Arguably, there are still reasons for facilities to do online, offline type of work. And in broadcast in particular, there really might be many reasons for doing a certain setup that just, you know, makes it more efficient. Yeah. Cost efficiency in some online offline scenarios is still there. And by the way, I, th I think we'll see the return of it in a way when there is capable 8K recording, but still for a lot of shows, you'll only need HD output, right? Um, I don't think we're going to edit 8K just because you can. Just changing the subject entirely to food. So, yes. enough about this boring video shit, let's talk food. <laughs> let's talk about food. Um, How is your quote-unquote beer base? Well, to be honest, I was, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to swap to food. Um, it's good, I mean, it's certainly, there's nothing wrong with it, but... Mm -hmm. um, it's very nice. You might, might find it flavoured differently than what you'd expect from a Yeah, but, you know... But I think yours has been better. I mean, the, your, your version of the Chipino was... Well, the Chipino is a different thing, but... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's lacking excitement. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's a perfectly competent meal and probably, you know, appropriate for the context, but mm -hmm. it's a perfectly com competent meal. What, what got you interested in cooking and food? Because yeah. you do cook, you're not just an I eater. Do. I do, I didn't just tease you. <laughs> and we would have done this today, but unfortunately... You only got back. <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, the main problem is that today my wife has a, a couple of friends over. Uh, and I just... I, I didn't have the guts to tell her, I'm sorry, I've got friends here from down under. We need to cook. <laughs> <laughs> Marital harmony is very important. Mm. Yeah, so as we had to switch days. Well, you know, next time you're in town, we'll definitely do some cooking. Now that I know you're interested, we'll probably do a little cooking competition. Oh. I have, well, we, like you said uh, earlier... That that's what got me interested, by the way. So, with man, it's always about competing, isn't it? <laughs> no, honestly, I lived actually uh, next door to a really, really super good cook from Italy. Um, and he invited me over for dinner a couple of times, and I thought, this is ridiculous. Uh, I, I need to be able to invite him, too. <laughs> uh, it got, he got me interested because dinner was basically cooking 90% of the time we actually were in the kitchen because all of it was kind of very much alive and part of the evening was to cook to actually see where stuff came from and how it ended up being in the pan and fried and then eventually got onto the plate yes, yes. Uh, which is also why I appreciate it uh, whenever talking about your booyah base whenever things are freshly made mm. if there's fantastic flavor and if there's a sensation about the food I love it but I care much more about everything just being made in this very kitchen. Whenever there's just the tiniest piece of convenience in it, I'm not going to that restaurant anymore. It's, it's something that, that I will definitely just, you know, there's a check mark, don't go there anymore. <laughs> you can actually tell by the menu. If there's more than, say, yeah. a dozen items on the menu, how can that cook possibly do everything 
fresh from the market. It's not yes. possible. Yes. And that, that's when it starts to get iffy for me. So that guy got me interested, eventually started inviting him over to my place. Obviously, it was a, a humbling experience as I had a master <laughs> chef coming to my kitchen. All I had was one pen. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm not saying you need a lot of tools to be a good cook. I, I still that's cook true. with probably the least amount of, of stuff in any kitchen. And my wife's just kind of, how can you do good meals with what you got there? Uh, <laughs> But uh, I actually like to talking about a reduction and slowing things down. I like to actually reduce it to the things that I can understand and touch and see. Mm -hmm. Microwave, probably really a, a great invention. But, yeah. but I don't want one. <laughs> great invention, but it doesn't enhance cooking. No. Yeah. It was one of the things, um, okay, this, is, this will probably explain to you quite clearly my um, attitude towards cooking. One of the very, very first tools that I spent money on was a pressure cooker because I was at university and I thought, I haven't got a lot of money um, and I don't have a lot of time because you get home and there isn't really a lot of time to do things. But I kind of thought, you know, when I looked at things, it's like, well, really the best food comes from these kind of like slow cooked, uh, cheaper cuts of meat. Um, I won't say peasant food, but you know what I mean, the more mm -hmm. affordable things. And it's like, yeah. you know, I'm at university, I haven't got a lot of money, I haven't got a lot of time. Mm -hmm. How can you do slow cooked food? Mm. And the answer is speed it up. And that's not a microwave. It's a pressure cooker. So yes. um, I dropped money on that um, very early on. Mm -hmm. And smart, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a foodie for a long time. Um, and since then, one of the things I've come to really appreciate, I still use the pressure cooker several times a week, don't oh, I? Yeah. That same yeah. one, 25 mm -hmm. years old or whatever it is. Um, I work from home. One of the things that I really like is being able to sort of say, Ooh, it's four o'clock. I'm going to start chopping up some things and put right. it on and then go back to my desk and then come up, give it a stir and go back to my and desk. Let me guess, when you go back to your desk, there's at least one good idea that you can make productive right away. I like being able to step away from the desk and there's something very, I don't know what it is, but when you are chopping vegetables or you're stirring mm -hmm. and it's not really totally engaging the brain. Mm -hmm. So you've sort of got this background process yes. kind of mm -hmm. happening, but your hands are busy. Um, and you've been careful not to cut yourself. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I have taken the tip off a finger once, and so you can't be completely out of it. Um, and yeah, it's it's very good. It's a very good break for the brain. It's incredible. Whenever my wife is getting a five meal course on a Wednesday, she knows what it is. I always get the same smile. Then, okay, you got a tough nut to crack at work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's cooking as meditation in a way. Uh, for me, that's totally true. And there's another thing now that I'm on paternity leave. Obviously, I'm thinking about a couple of things too for my kids. I think it's, it's actually a horrible thing we're doing to our kids to just basically have prepared meals right. uh, at kindergarten, at school. Everywhere you look, there's just, you know, there's no relationship between where food comes from, how it's prepared and how it eventually ends up being on your plate. I think it's a huge disservice to society yes. and, and, and it shows in so many not so good ways. Yes, um, one, it's been very, very interesting for us to be in Europe for the last three weeks. Um, we've had a bit of a travel around, it's been Barcelona and then um, Amsterdam and now Munich. And the quality of food in Europe is so much better than what it is in the US. It's, it's almost frightening. I would think it depends on where you are. In Seattle, for example, where I am now, because we have an office there where, for example, a lot of the After Effects team is at home. Staggering. There's so much good food. Uh, not to say you, you really have to look hard for a place where you, you're being served with the kind of food apparently we all three don't like. Yeah. Um, Go to San Francisco, still good. LA, still good. A lot of places in between, not so much. I think the, the truth is you'll find that there are a lot of foodies in certain places in the US. Sure. So it's, it's a little, I, th I think it's a little unfair to generalize. But overall, yes. I mean, we've all been probably to some areas in the mid Midwest, no offense. <laughs> uh, the food chain though, I think in, in Europe is not as corrupt as it is, right. is in the United States yet. The, but apparently is heading that way. I think we're heading that way. And, and yes, I'm, I'm frightened by it. Because as we just talked about, there, there can be so many great things, not only about eating good food, but even about preparing it. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's part of, I think it's part of our culture for a reason. We didn't just start preparing food because it is nicer than just, you know, 
<laughs> Put, putting a cow on a road day instead, <laughs> right. which we will see at Oktoberfest, right? Yes. <laughs> there are more refined ways of yeah. cooking. There's a reason for it. Yeah. I think there's a reason why uh, we came to like it. And, there's, and a, there's, a real there's a risk of losing it. The real tradition in Europe, which it goes, well, it, it exists because of its immense history. So yeah. I think there is a reluctance to sort of to change things. You know, it's very, it's even with the with the the beer at Oktoberfest, it's very very important that it's done in a particular way, and you can't even where it's done, right? Yes, yes. You can't participate. You can't actually have a tent there if the brewery is not located and producing in Munich. Right. Mm. So there are there it's are rules and regulations. People. There is tradition and history. So I think that Europe is a little more reluctant to. Uh, I was going to say embrace the modern way, but embrace a <laughs> embrace a more industrialized way. Um, Producing food. I mean, yeah. I, it, what they what they did in the U.S. I think is it, it had good reasons. You know, it's like can we can we make food more For affordable? More yeah. yeah, and that's a really really good um, except, attitude. Except then you end up being the cost of the food being the only criteria. It's like right. you know you could do that, but as long as we keep the quality, yes. there should have been a balance that hasn't been reached. No, yeah, and it's it's bad for it's bad for the animals and it's it's yeah. bad for the food supply. Yeah. One of the ways we focus our travel is that we're not particularly art gallery or museum people. Mm -hmm. And so we've decided that when we travel and when we're home as well, but we will eat something local and then work out how to cook it and cook it locally where we can. So that's what we did in Barcelona. We ate two dishes locally. Mm -hmm. We prepared it and trying to cut chorizo sausage with a steak knife is not a fun experience. Trust me. <laughs> it was a talk about slow cooking <laughs> and in a tiny little kitchen. But, but again, it was, you know, it was fun. It was, you know, to, trying to just do these things and understand the, the dish in its context is, is really fun and a way of focusing the travel and, and learning more about the culture. Because you've got to go to a market or you've got to go to where it's locally prepared, or local ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in so. Amsterdam. Bei Ihnen ist noch alles recht. Passt noch alles, ja? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, an example of the difference in the food supplies, um, the supply chain. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, Philip really likes to eat raw beef. And um, one of his favorite things is steak tartare. I, I blame my mother. In my, in my baby book, do you know what the baby book is? Where the mother keeps track of the first... Yeah, it's my mother says, one of Philip's favorite things to quiet him down when he's anxious is to put a little bit of raw meat in a bit of cloth and chew on that. So I blame my mother. <laughs> I have never heard of that. No, I, I had forgotten about it. Of course, only read it in my baby book only a few years ago. Are there any pictures? Is there any video? Not at Then it didn't happen. <laughs> So regardless where it came from, yeah. So you really like steak tartare. I do. Um, and we have found through through a Belgian friend of ours, we discovered that there's a Belgian kind of variant of it that that gets served in in the Benelux regions on on uh, bread rolls. Mm. And you discovered that the first year you went to um, Amsterdam yep. for, for IBC and had it for lunch one day, and then the second day, and then the third <laughs> day. <laughs> so last year. Um, when we were in Amsterdam and we just went to the local supermarket we weren't at a high-end butcher or whatever and here was prepared already ground steak tartare for sale mm -hmm. so here was meat that you could pick up in the supermarket and were expected to eat raw it was right next to Hamburg you wouldn't eat that mm -hmm. but that would that could never happen in the American supermarket supply chain mm -hmm. it could never happen I mean people are even scared to serve you know, medium rare hamburgers because right. of, of, yeah. of yes. the, and that's got to be the difference between how things are made. And, and, you know, the other odd thing, although I don't quite understand the reasons for it, but whatever, um, in Europe, eggs are never refrigerated. In America, they're refrigerated in the supermarket. You must take them home and put them in the fridge, leave for eggs out on the counter and there can mm -hmm. be problems. I don't know why that is, but, but it all sounds odd. I think overall, there's something interesting about are you even able to appreciate good food? If you don't learn it in the first couple of years, if, if there's nothing in your childhood, which is why I believe your story, if there's nothing in your childhood that connects you with the diversity in food and a well-prepared meal, you're not going to appreciate it later. So if it starts with convenience food, and actually, I kid you not, I, I think it, it starts pretty much the first year 
right. in a baby's life. If, if there is nothing but, you know, sugared Nestle convenience stuff yes. in your first year, there's probably going to be a lot more sugared stuff for the rest of your life. And the yes. very same companies make money off of selling you the drugs that will keep you somewhat in shape later, yeah. which right. is probably no coincidence. <laughs> Uh, are, are food drug companies and drug companies, are they related a lot? Well, the problem is that the food companies don't care about health and the health companies don't care about food. Uh, and the, the fact is that they're completely separated, but they do work... They sim- yeah, yeah, there, there are certain benefits. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Work what, what do you think has been the biggest change in, in, or just biggest change over the time of your career? It can be technology, it can be society. What, what is the biggest change? In my life or in my career? <laughs> Let's go with career, but it doesn't have to be just technology. Hmm. Wow, that's a tough question for me. Because there have, there have been so many yes. changes in the last 15 years. That's also what keeps it exciting for me before I give you one arbitrary answer. It's not like we're done with anything yet, right? There, there's something new every other year. Some things are predictable, some others are not. Uh, most of it is really exciting and indeed we're, we're still transforming. We've been talking about this difference between technology and creativity and sometimes that technology gets in the way, sometimes it actually enables creativity or a new kind of crea- creativity or a new way of expressing your existing creativity. Uh, the most interesting thing though, if, if you want to look at one particular thing, was actually when um, John Lowry invis- invited us in uh, 2004 to see his facility. I was blown away with everything that was done there at the time. So uh, if you don't know that, uh, Lowry Digital at the time was actually uh, charged with uh, restoring all of the Bond series next okay. to many other things from the archive which are exciting. Mm-hmm. And they came up with incredible technology, some of it pretty standard today, some of it still unparalleled in terms of how exotic and exciting and interesting and innovative it was. That's, by the way, the main reason why Speedgrade even came about that year, or one of the driving factors why it became a product, uh, because we got involved with uh, John and his desire to do everything, haha, based on metadata. That's when I learned the real deal about metadata, at least for all I care about, they didn't want to process the frames multiple times. Right. They wanted to do the dust removal, the scratch removal, the color restoration, the multi-frame, inter-frame interpolation, everything they wanted to do to get the best possible quality out of their picture, everything they wanted to have done in one pass on the render farm. And it seemed so impossible when we started that project and eventually it all came to life and we were standing, this is the one moment, and I could send you the picture. Lynn and I were in in the server room back in the day, there was no um, um, regular Mac server. What was the name of it? Oh God, it's so long ago. The XServe? The XServe, thank you. So there was no XServe yet. You can cut that out. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't let Apple know that I forgot about the name. <laughs> that's all right. They, that's they, they forgot. They forgot about they it forgot too. Forgot the same, yeah. <laughs> so it was before it existed and before Apple forgot about it yes. again. Yes. <laughs> uh, we were standing in a room full of, at the time, roughly a thousand Mac Pros. The noise of it, the sound of it, knowing that on about 500 of them, we've had a speak rate note running restoring the very first Bond movie <laughs> while we were in that room so Dr. No was being processed. Nice. But for me that was actually a pivotal moment because uh, all of a sudden everything seemed possible. Mm. Right? Before I was part of that project everything seemed so linear and that was kind of ooh. No it isn't. <laughs> really a defining moment. You would probably really enjoy reading the book about Pixar because they kind of had similar moments mm-hmm. where they were suddenly they were able to do things on a computer and right. it was it was chugging away and isn't it fantastic <laughs> it, it's certainly never perfect when you first approach things like it but uh, i wish everyone could actually have that moment of excitement when you go through a technology technological change because then it doesn't matter much that you don't have this or that or something in the analog tradition had an advantage you can't quite have yet or mm. or mm-hmm. repeat if you will or put something in place that has the same quality and tradition so, sometimes it doesn't matter being disruptive sometimes also means to accept that some things aren't as good as they used to be yeah yeah and it may not be perfect but um 
as this brand new thing, it shows so much potential about, wow, here we are now, but imagine what this is going to be in 20 years time. Yes, indeed. Which brings me to my next interesting oh, question. One, yeah, yes. The... You're very welcome. That was a direct <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me right to my next question, which is, what do you think will be the biggest disruptor in, in the future and the rest of your career? Or what will be the biggest change in the rest of your career? Or what do you look forward to, maybe? I look forward to a couple of things, actually. Provided that I do what I've always done, which is to embrace the serendipity. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think 3D printing is becoming very exciting oh, and yes, interesting. Indeed. Yeah. So no one's mentioned that yet. Mm. There are a lot of things I can imagine that you would want to build moving forward that either weren't doable or were done, but in a process that you didn't control. That is very interesting. And yes. I'm not talking about printing my own chair. I don't think no, no. that that is the exciting part about it. But, you know, Look at what's happening with drones these days. Oh, God, yes. There's a technology that came out of nowhere. Uh, you, you can build really specialized vehicles, and it doesn't have to be in the air. It could be anything. It could be on the ground. It could be, it could be really anything that has a purpose that was hard to build or impossible yeah. to build before because the prototyping part of it was so hard and so expensive. Now, you know, I can easily imagine that kids at school will do interesting project, projects uh, when they're, you know, eighth grade, tenth grade, I don't care, uh, when, when they start getting interested in, in those kind of activities, one in a thousand might actually come up with a fantastic idea. Maybe it's in healthcare, maybe it's in transportation, I don't know, but there, yeah, yeah, it yeah. seems to be limitless right now what could happen in the next couple of years. The other thing, if we're talking about film and video, I think beyond what we've talked about becoming much more immersive for the next couple of years, there's, there's definitely one step beyond which I'm thrilled about, even though I don't quite know how to grasp it yet, being able to maneuver and control within a movie beyond what you see in a game today, the gamification of movies, if you will, not, not in, in the traditional sense that there's a movie and then you build a, a game upon it, but actually both becoming one, that could be very interesting. And obviously there's another technology that kind of caters to that notion being fully in it, being fully engaged and immersed, VR yeah. is a thing that I don't quite know what to make of it yet because I haven't seen anything that is very comfortable, mm -hmm. but that's teething problems. Yes. I, I yeah, can, yeah, I yeah, can yeah, see yeah. beyond the heavy or not so good yeah. glasses, if you will. It's not really glasses, is it, yeah, is it right? Exactly. Systems, whatever yeah, you want yeah, to call yeah, it. Yeah. I, I can see beyond that and just see that being someplace else, <laughs> while I'm actually still here, yeah. could be very interesting too. Oh, yeah. And so does that also mean that the viewer is uh, experiencing the movie in a different way? They're, they're almost walking through it or moving through it in a... In I think you can actually stick with a certain character for much longer than you do in, right. in the edit that we're presenting you with right now. I actually see this already um, when, when you talk with people who are a bit more naive about how things are being produced today and, and they've had both games and movies and of course the real life, if you talk to like um, my niece being a perfect example, if you talk to a 14 year old, um, it would be perfectly natural for her to say that the movie is going to be experienced through the eyes of her favorite character. Or even better, she can watch her favorite character all of the time instead of doing all the silly over the shoulder shots which have been established because otherwise you couldn't tell the story the way it's been presented so far. If you're getting in it, if you become part of a scene, that is not that necessary anymore. Right? Does that mean that two people could sit down and watch a movie together and both of them have a completely different experience? So what would they talk about over, over dinner afterwards? I think they will talk about much more because indeed then it's much more like real life too. Yeah, right. We're sitting here, but you've been seeing everything that's going on behind me and vice versa. We haven't seen the same things for the yeah. last hour or, or so, and it's actually sometimes it's interesting to mention that the fountain over there actually had quite an interesting lean over There's because a fountain? yes, there is a fountain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, it could be more interesting and more engaging because indeed, then you can actually talk about some of the meaning yeah. of the story because right. you've experienced it from a certain perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back around full circle, back to food. Mm -hmm. 3D printed pizzas—it's a real thing. Oh. Really? I'm not joking. Because I haven't had one, so I'm not. No, a I, I would not. <laughs> Do I need to try? No, I don't think so. I, okay. <laughs> it's probably something. Yeah, I, I haven't either, but it's probably something that would be would be kind of interesting. But yes, I mean pizza. So it's a flat shape. It's an easy printable shape. It's got relatively few ingredients. But I don't know what the substrate would be that would create a kind of a. How do you get? How do you print gluten? 
I mean, how do you print that glutinous structure that you create with, with kneading dough? I mean, no. it's, it's not going to be the same thing. I, I, I think it's just people, they're very much caught up in this whole um, Star Trek replicator thing and they want to be able to have That's a replicator food. right there. Yes. And that's also the reason why I appreciate that they're trying. Yes, yeah. yes. I probably don't want to eat it, but, you know, kudos to them for giving it a go. Well, it shows that it is not that important anymore what kind of material is your base material for the printing process, what kind of temperature the process needs to be established in, because the pizza certainly is different than, you know, a cup. Yes. And it also goes to show that it doesn't have to be the, the same kind of materials in general that we yeah. used to do to build shapes, right? Yeah. It's imitating food, and there is my problem. I don't like an imitation of something where the original is yeah. so good, good. Yeah. right? Yeah. Ah, but we could have 3D printed edible cups. Heston Maybe. Blumenthal Maybe. would love that. Well, yes. With your name on it on Starbucks. Yes, <laughs> even better. With your nickname. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's great. Greg again, he's printing another elephant cup. <laughs> Do you have any career advice that you'd give your younger self or to people starting out now, other than embrace the serendipity? That's a question that's come up frequently after the acquisition. Ah. As always, people are interested, how did you do it? How did you get here? Are you sad about selling your company? What would you have done differently to make your own as big as Adobe? And all those questions where I'm not quite sure I'm interested in finding the answer. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's more interesting indeed to talk about what, what's generally something that's a good setup that, that you'd be happy with whether or not there is success or not. Because um, the one thing that I can guarantee is that there is no guarantee for success. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a certain amount of guarantee for having fun though. So the one thing that I've always said and will always tell people who are asking for that kind of advice, make sure you're with the right people. Make sure you work with people you actually really enjoy being with. Mm -hmm doesn't mean you need to be best buddies and go to a pub every day, but it needs to be, you need to be in company that's inspiring. We've talked about environment. Mm -hmm. I think even more important for the creative process and building software, I consider to be a very creative process. Uh, just to be clear, I'm not talking about just the people using Adobe software. I'm, I'm talking about the very people we're building the software with. Inspiration doesn't come from thinking very long and hard, at least not for me. Uh, I think it comes from, indeed, all, all the things you gather, all the interesting conversations you can have. What I tell most people at Adobe who are a bit younger than me is uh, that they're not drinking enough coffee. That would probably be my one advice, drink more coffee. And I'm not talking about the cup that you take into your little office space and, and secretly enjoy it there thinking that you probably already had too many. <laughs> I'm talking about the one where you get together in the cafeteria with other people, probably those you never met before, have a conversation and see what comes out of it, right? Um, Harking back to the, the um, creativity, the book about Pixar, uh -huh. one of the, the basic design fundamentals of their, their headquarters when they built it was to right. maximize the interaction. The meeting space is massive there. Yeah. And it's a gorgeous space. Apparently, Steve Jobs argued that they should only have one set of bathrooms for the entire complex so that people would have to get together at one place. Some oh, that's a, that's a story I didn't hear yet. <laughs> I think that's overdoing it a I little, but, but I agree with the principle. <laughs> they also felt that they, the, the, the Pixar people did, did uh, manage to convince Steve Jobs that it was not um, practical. Right. But they, they have engineered into the design of the, the very building the, the, interactions, the interactivity between people for that very reason. So that people who are engineers interact with the creative people and, mm -hmm. and people working on one movie and will interact with people on another movie and share ideas and share technologies and techniques and, and just help each other with solving the problems that making their type of movie does. Of course, so, the whole book is really about storytelling and how much yes. impor how important the storytelling is and the characters are way and above the technology. But The traditional way of re referring to that is kind of a water cooler moment, isn't it? Yeah. Where you're sort yeah. Of, but I guess in Steve Jobs' um, design for Pixar, it was going to be a water closet moment. Oh, <laughs> Ron, you said the... <laughs> Well, I keep seeing WC all over Germany. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, I'm, I'm not sold on that particular idea, but yeah, making room for people to get mm. together and actually, you know, just enjoy a good conversation. It might be something unrelated to work. I've had sure. some of the best ideas come out of non-productive conversations. Yeah. Right? And if you think about what I told you about how Iridus got started, was a complete accident. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't planned and probably you could have planned it for it at the time. Some other companies did and they weren't successful. So um, 
being with the right people very important and I also think indeed the serendipity it's not for everyone I think um, that wouldn't be general advice but if you're the kind of guy who enjoys challenges and, and you know being out there not necessarily knowing whether there is a left or a right turn coming up next it is very exciting to just go with that flow rather than trying to know all about tomorrow because honestly in this industry if, if you pretend you do <laughs> um, you're not thinking straight there's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. there's there well you could know a lot about tomorrow but not the day after <laughs> yeah, let's just say we, we see some of the things coming but uh, if we do this again in 10 years time and I hope we will we'll probably talk about technology that hasn't been mentioned in any of the magazines printed this year we'll probably talk about cra crazy things that mm. have been considered Star Trek up until now and for another five years who knows right mm. so it is very interesting to be, be able to transform that but I, again I don't think it's because there's an opportunity to transform it it's, it's mostly because there's something else beyond that that you can use as a driving factor so there's the outside world with all the people you want to engage with and then there are the people all around you and, and having all those connections come together there's there's something magic about it really which is also why i dearly missed going to ibc as much as you can say you get all the information and, and yeah, i did yeah, actually yeah, yeah, yeah. i know everything that's been released at the show sure. it wasn't very meaningful to me this year honestly because what makes all those events exciting is all that flow it's it's more how that information comes to you and who you're getting it from not so much that it exists and who you sat next to on the aircraft on the way over oh um, yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a firm believer in serendipity i mean most of my career has never gone the way i planned it <laughs> most of the things we set out to do along the way have never quite gone the way we planned it but every step forward has taken us to a place where the next step could happen which has taken us to a place where the next step is, could happen, to, mm -hmm. it's taken us to a place where we are now, which I find incredibly exciting. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. Who'd have known that the metadata, which I apparently started talking about well into the early 1990s, according to one of my colleagues from that period. In um, this case, you definitely had a head start with it. <laughs> <laughs> would suddenly now in 2015 be a hot topic. And right. you know, we talked about so many subjects where metadata is going to be essential in the future and drive everything. Um, it's fascinating. It's just absolutely fascinating. And uh, like I said, Will, it's been a wonderful lunch. Thank you very much for coming and sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And uh, if people do want to get in touch with you, where can they find you? Well, um. for the next six months, <laughs> people who know where to find me will find I mean, me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> IBC. No, NAB next year. NAB will be. next year. Patrick will be NAB next year for sure. I'll be there. Um, other than that, I think uh, I'm not necessarily hiding anything on Facebook and I like to respond to questions there. Um, I'm not the most active Twitter user, so Facebook is probably a good idea. My email address is also not that hard to get if you want to get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably a simple Google search would find that.